Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Juliet Hooker, and I'm a professor of political science at Brown University. And um, I am very grateful for the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, which has um, uh, brought us this event. Um, and particularly, I would like to thank Shanna Weinberg and Catherine Van Amberg and Maya Rivers for so ably taking care of all the planning required to put this event together, as well as all the technical assistance we're getting from Brown Media Services. Our panel today is part of the Center's This is America series, which explores the various forms of structural violences rooted in anti-Black racism that are embedded within US social, political, and economic systems. Today's panel, Black Politics and U.S. Democracy Beyond Mourning and Sacrifice brings together some of the most insightful and original scholars of Black politics specializing in social movements, racial violence, and U.S. political development and Black feminist theory to help us think through this moment in U.S. racial politics. Almost 10 years after the killing of Trayvon Martin gave rise to the Black Lives Matter hashtag, and the uprising spurred by the ongoing killings of Black people by police officers, most recently George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and the massive multiracial protests for racial justice that took place in response to their deaths last summer. The pivotal role of Black activists, especially Black women, in the electoral defeat of racist right-wing forces in the 2020 election, as well as the violent January 6th 2021 insurrection or white riot at the US Capitol that followed that loss. Our panelists today are uniquely positioned to help us situate the current era of Black protests focused on racial justice and anti-Black violence in historical perspective and to help us see, as the Reverend Martin Luther King asked in 1977 in his last published work, which I thought this week, so I'm thinking about it, where do we go from here? I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we will proceed. Um, Megan Min Ming Francis is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington, who writes about constitutional development, racial violence, philanthropy, and the long civil rights movement. Among other publications, she's the author of a multiple award-winning book, Civil Rights and the Making of the Modern American State. In 2020, she was named one of 12 Freedom Scholars by the Marguerite Casey Foundation and Group Health Foundation, which were, are awarded to the nation's boldest scholars who stand at the forefront of movements for economic and social justice. Megan's scholarship asks us to think deeply about how movements for social justice are funded and to pay attention to the money and how it can end up shaping movement priorities, a topic that is absolutely crucial today as we seem to be experiencing a moment of woke capitalism and increase philanthropic attention to various social justice movements. Our next panelist is Shatima Threadcraft, who is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Philosophy at Vanderbilt, who writes about racial justice, feminist theory, embodiment, and Black subject making. Among other publications, she's the author of a multiple award-winning book, Intimate Justice, The Black Female Body and the Body Politic, and is currently working on a project on the role of violence in the constitution of the Black public sphere and the gender divide and spectacular Black deaths that has been central to narratives of Black peoplehood. Shatima's scholarship has changed the way that I think about racial justice and what it entails. She has made Black feminist insights about the ability to exercise intimate capacities and who becomes an icon of Black suffering inescapable questions for any truly capacious account of racial justice. And last but certainly not least, we have Diva Woodley, who is Associate Professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research, who writes about American politics, social movements, and democratic theory. She's the author of The Politics of Common Sense, How Social Movements Use Public Discourse to Change Politics and Win Acceptance, and an avidly anticipated forthcoming book on the movement for Black lives, called Reckoning, Black Lives Matter, and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements. 
While there is no shortage of books already published or currently being written about the movement for Black Lives, Diva's forthcoming book and her work in general epitomizes the best model of a scholar who approaches social movements and activists not as objects of study, but as producers of knowledge and democratic actors par excellence whose work leads the way for us all. So I am absolutely thrilled that they all agreed to spend time with us today and and are here to share um, their brilliance with us. We're going to have each one of them speak for five minutes about how their current um, and past research um, speaks to the themes of the panel, and then we'll turn into some general questions um, to be followed at the end by some uh, Q&A that will be open to you. If you have questions um, for the Q&A, if anything comes up um, while they're talking, you can paste this put those in the Q&A um, function and we will get to them when we get to that portion of the webinar. So I'm turning things over to Megan. Great, thank you so much uh, to Brown University for hosting this, um, to, to the center, to uh, Juliet for just excellent moderation skills and for that very, very generous introduction. And I'm just thrilled to be here in company of Two extraordinary, my panelists here, Diva and Shatima. Um, I'm, I, I'm just so excited about this conversation and grateful to this space and pandemic to be, to be able to have this conversation. And to everyone who is watching, hey there, um, and thanks for spending time with us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna speak for about four and a half minutes um, about my research and how it connects to the themes. Um, I wanna start off by saying, that my work in political science, I think, has been focused on um, two main stories. Um, and that's, I think, kind of the connective tissue. One story um, about how do, how do we tell stories that we think we know well in different ways, specifically about Black people. Um, and then another kind of another focus on wanting to understand the role of racial violence in American politics. Um, I, as a graduate student I, at Princeton University, I was interested not necessarily um, in attitudes and racial attitudes, but I was interested in a different area of Black politics about how did Black people throughout the course of American history contest the structures um, of American democracy. And so what I did early on um, is try to tell this story about Black political actors in the early 20th century um, and how they contested white supremacy in the, in the law, how they contested white supremacy um, through the kind of the normal ways that politics were constructed at the local and the state level, as well as how they contested policies and politics at the national level. And I told that through a story of the NAACP's campaign around racial violence in the first quarter of the 20th century. Um, and for me, it was really important to think about Black political organizing outside of this romantic period in terms of this 1954 to 1964, 1965 time period that I think that we all normally learn about kind of the timeline of civil rights. And this is when we have mobilization. And I learned that story, but I, that wasn't the full story. Um, and so my research has been kind of like this earlier period in political science and even in some in history. And it often been kind of this top down story that I was told. And it was that all of these things happened to black people. And there wasn't that much for me in terms of literature about, okay, and then how did black people contest those structures and how did they change things, right? How did we get to Brown v. Board? How did we get to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1965? Not because of white benevolence, not because white people learned the error of their ways, but because black people fought and died and forced America to show up differently. Um, and so I told the story about, for me, it was, I, I actually focused when I went into to do archival research, I thought I was gonna tell a 1950s story about the NAACP um, and kind of the, 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 I actually did not know how to do archival research at the time that I started my dissertation work, which is like terrible, but I figured it out. Um, and I started reading the NAACP archives at the very beginning in 1909 when the organization began. And when I started reading these uh, archives in 2005, it was a story that I had never heard before about how the NAACP in the first two decades of the organization's existence were consumed with this issue of racial violence, this belief that there was something that needed to be done at the national level about 
lynching and mob violence in order for black people to be free that the state and white vigilante violence could not continue. And that was like the pinnacle issue in the black freedom movement, more important at that time than voting and education. And I was like, this is fascinating, at least in so many of the stories that I had been told, there wasn't a story about kind of the structuring role of racial violence and how important racial violence was to one, black imaginations and dreaming about democracy, as well as the way in which white supremacy was, was held in place. Um, and so I told about the NAACP's campaign in the legislative arena and the executive arena um, in public opinion and in courts. Um, and I showed how the NAACP was thinking about racial violence um, and uh, a number of their accomplishments and how that kind of helped to pave the way to the modern 1950s, 1960s mo movement and how it also provided a precursor to the movement for Black Lives or the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that we see today. I mean, in terms of, it has been at least my lesson throughout my research that Black protest historically has served as a kind of testimony to the nation's most vulnerable and its ability to expose the bankruptcy um, of a country that has failed repeatedly at offering equal justice and equality for all of its citizens. The last thing I'll say, because I know that I'm running out of time here, um, is that my that work and that focus on the NAACP's campaign around racial violence gave way to another focus that is still, I believe, structured on thinking about black politics and thinking about American democracy um, and thinking about capitalism, which has given way to a focus on wanting to understand the role of the donor community um, and funders in black and the black freedom movement and movement activism. Um, the main kind of my my one minute thing here, and I promise here, and then I'll end, is that I was I spent after I wrote my first book a while trying to figure out why the NAACP shifted um, from a dominant focus on racial violence to a dominant focus on education desegregation, um, and where my research kind of led me was to draw a connection to um, a radical funder um, and um, the role of a funder in, in co-opting um, the agenda or capturing the agenda of the NAACP. And I think that this is something that we still need to pay attention to um, in the movement. So I'll end there. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Megan. Tina? Okay, uh, so I want to echo Megan and and say um, thank you to Brown, to the center, and to Juliet. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be in conversation truly with uh, some of the thinkers that I hold in highest regard in political science. So my current research is on the on Black death, public private divide, the place of anti-Black violence in the stories of Black peoplehood, and I think what intersectionality and abolition, what has been called abolition feminism, have revealed about recent carceral feminist state building and therefore what their work has to say to political theorists. Succinctly, I think they're saying that the white feminist Leviathan is deadly for Black women. It is not secure, commodious living, but in fact makes life too nasty, brutish, and short. So we're in the midst of a significant social movement anchored in, as Diva has told me, the murders of Black men in public space. Black women are not only less likely to die at the hands of police, but when they do, they're often killed in private, in their homes. So here, Breonna Taylor's death echoes the deaths of many women whose names were called on to say. Eleanor Bumpers, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Rakia Boyd, Atatiana Jefferson, Katherine Johnston, Charlena Lyles, and Pearly Golden. Uh, and because the death, occur in private, they cannot be recorded by impartial, unrelated parties who are familiar figures since the Rodney King tape ushered us into this new era. So it is not lost on thinkers like Kimberly Crenshaw that Breonna Taylor's vote rose with the tide of recorded male murders. So the lack of visual documentation isn't the only narrative complication facing Black women um, dealing with state violence. So the violence Black women experience at the hand of police is bound up in intimacy, um, obviously connected to my earlier work. It therefore does not fit our dominant narrative, dominant frames for understanding racist violence, uh, a, a frame that is dominated, um, in my understanding, by the lynching narrative. Black women, Andrea Ritchie says, are killed in the context of calls for help. 
calls for help in mental health crises, calls for help in their relationships with Black men, calls for help with intimate partner violence, and calls for help around sexual assault. Crenshaw says, as long as Black women lose their lives in circumstances like these, their life, lost life won't be dramatized in a way that mobilizes the kinds of reforms that have to happen in order to protect more life and make and hold police officers accountable. So there's also the problem of police as safety, something that has been thoroughly uh, questioned by the current social movement. The laws and policies that supposedly protect women from male violence in practice have only protected white women and do that arguably at the expense of increased state violence against black women and the loss of black female life. So mandatory arrest policies have been of particular concern for feminists. Here, Crenshaw states, uh, cites a Milwaukee study that concluded that the safety that mandatory arrest policies brought to white women come at the direct expense of the safety of black women, where mandatory arrest policies in the study prevented 2,504 acts of violence against primarily white women at the price of 5,409 acts of violence against primarily black women. So at um, to protect one black like one white woman's life, two black women were harmed. Also, I think what happens we have to think about what happens to our story of racist death and racist murder when it has to accommodate a story of death that happens after the police leave, where police help to create the conditions of murder that lead to death but do not murder themselves. So Crenshaw cites a study that concluded that intimate partner homicides increased by 60% um, in states with mandatory arrest laws. So what I'm trying to get at following Crenshaw but also disagreeing with her sometimes is the difficulty Black women face in harnessing social movements to accomplish their aims. Um, regarding your, uh, I think, some of your questions, Juliet, I know the joke is that the relationship between Black people and democracy in the U.S. is, um, is sort of one-to-one, -one, right? So they're one and the same. Black people are the democracy that we have had here. The Venn diagram is a circle, and recently that seems true. But I think in thinking about this question, you know, I think about Diva's work um, on the democratic necessity of social movements in relation to Glenn Coulthard, who has the Hegelian perspective on equality and freedom, that one must be recognized according to the terms that you and your community create. Said recognition is vital to democratic equality, vital to democracies. Cossard makes direct action the first part of his program, but Diva's work makes apparent the work that Black-led social movements, and I think in here including women's movements and queer movements that are Black-led even when those facts fall away, but these social movements are key in bringing about said recognition. So where social movements lead to new forms of recognition, vital and healthy democracies, stereotypes, criminalization and misrecognition. These are all white responses to black assertions of equality, but social movements are the best anecdote we have to um, so far to these moves. So black women need them and lead them, but it is so hard to harness them to their aims. Thank you. Thank you, um, Shatima and Megan. Thank you um, to you, Juliet, for having us here at the Center at Brown University. Um, so, what I want to say is that my work is uh, about social change, and it's uh, particularly about how it is that people who band together are able to make other worlds possible. Um, this has been sort of the animating um, drive of my scholarship uh, from um, undergrad when I was uh, most vigorously involved in um, uh, political activism and organizing, um, and sort of what came from up for me in that time. Um, was that all the people that I was organizing with were fantastically committed, fantastically um, uh, talented, um, incredibly determined, um, had a lot of vision. Um, but it wasn't always the case that um, those folks were uh, interested in, um, or as interested as I thought they should be, um, in the actual efficacy of the things that they believed, right? That is, how it is that you make the things that you believe are right politically possible. Right. Um, and so my study of social movements uh, started out with this notion. And in my first book, The Politics of Common Sense, um, I looked at how social movements did and did not do this um, and what kinds of ways that we should assess the impacts of social movements and came to the conclusion that 
Um, when we are thinking about political change, we're not normally thinking about the things that are central to political science and even sort of popular pi politics um, designations of social movement success. So we're not necessarily talking about um, policy wins, at least not immediate policy wins. We're not necessarily talking about immediate um, sort of popularity and public opinion surveys. Um, you know, those kinds of things are lagging indicators of uh, social movement success. The ways that social movements succeed is by um, changing people's understanding of the way the world is, right? Changing people's understanding of their place in the world, right? Um, what social movements do is make it possible to make sense of the world in a different way. Uh, and so, of course, the movement for Black Lives is particularly um, exemplary of this fact. Uh, and, um, you know, we can go through sort of social movements in America and around the world and see the ways that social movements can reshape how we think about uh, the world as it is. But this particular movement has been self-conscious, pretty self-conscious about trying to reshape people's ideas about the way the world is. And we see that most immediately in terms of um, the ideas that have become rapidly become uh, popular uh, about the relationship between the general population and police and black people and police um, and the ways that um, notions of structural and systemic racism get articulated right through those examples um, that are repeated over time. Um, the other thing that I found in my research on this movement, the movement for Black Lives, or the, the, and, and there are several movements going on right now, of course, right? We are in a moment of contention, um, you know, what Sidney Terrell calls a cycle of contention, where there are social movements arising all over the world, um, arising because I think of the disjuncture between um, the uh, sort of uh, hegemonic philosophy of, um, you know, uh, liberal progress that reigned at the end of the 20th century, um, uh, where people, many people, um, misconceived uh, or misunderstood, um, perhaps on purpose, uh, that uh, all we could do was institute uh, sort of liberal democracies everywhere as much as possible, and that would somehow magically lead to greater tolerance, um, peace, and prosperity. Well, it turned out that that wasn't true, right? And many people, um, you know, uh, had been saying that many black and brown scholars, um, uh, uh, post-colonial and anti-colonial scholars had been saying that for a long time. But by the end of the 20th century, it became clear to almost everyone that the sort of hegemonic notions that they had been exposed to that had begun to organize our lives, that had been begun to organize public policy, not only in America, but around the world, were rubbing against the reality that actually most people were not prospering in most places. In fact, people were becoming more miserable, more sick, um, further from prosperity. Uh, and um, um, the popularity of um, ideologies um, uh, like uh, fascism um, um, were increasing, right, again, right, and outright, right, out in the open, um, racism, uh, sexism, were sort of re-emerging um, as uh, politics of, um, in the beginning, right, anti-political correctness and sort of we see down this, this road, right, that we have gone. So the movement for Black Lives emerges into this context, right, um, of um, tension um, and contention uh, in which people are trying to make sense of themselves um, in the world again. And people decide a variety of ways to do this, right? Um, and not all of them are positive. But what the movement does um, particularly well, I think more than other movements, is to actually um, operate from what I think is a distinct political philosophy, a 21st century political philosophy um, that offers us a different starting place to conceive of some of the major um, ways that we think about um, justice, uh, freedom, uh, our relationships to each other, um, uh, you know, community, right, accountability, um, uh, revitalizing the concept, for example, of abolition, right? So it offers us something uh, that we had not been offered, I think, have not been offered by other social movements that are actually going on at the same time and are, and all of this is also interconnected, right? Social movements often have networked communications with each other. Um, and that political philosophy that the movement offers us is something that I call radical black feminist pragmatism. And I just wanna say briefly what I think this is. Um, and maybe I should back up a little bit and say that my method in terms of studying social movements and studying social change is as um, 
uh, Juliet said so generously is absolutely theorizing from um, the point of view that the people who are on the ground making social chains are actually social theorists and political theorists in their own right. And we as scholars ought to pay attention um, to the theory that is emergent and sometimes explicit, right? Um, uh, emergent in their action um, and institutions, but also explicitly stated um, in their discourses. Uh, so radical black feminist pragmatism is just the name of, 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 of the uh, political philosophy that, the, that I learned from movement. Um, it is not mine. Um, what it combines are some very interesting um, elements that I think um, combat some of the tendencies of liberalism, um, uh, but not only liberalism, also the sort of the 20th century ideologies, right, uh, that tend to be sort of totalizing ideologies that are based on what Iris Young called the distributive paradigm, right? Um, that we need to, what we need to do is build institutions that have the right dis distribution of, um, of rights for uh, goods, and then we'll be fine. We can call that freedom and justice, right? The movement for Black Lives says, no, 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 we have to start in a different place. We have to start from the lived experience of those um, who are suffering the most. This is the black feminism, right? Um, and then we have to base our political action on the imagination of a, a more just set of relations, right? An imagination of the more, a more just set of relations. Um, and this is where the kind of radicalism and pragmatism comes in. The radicalism is in that the movement is willing to, in fact, dedicated to overturning our assumptions about the way things are and reconceiving problems in a different way. So for example, the problem of police violence is not um, conceived as a problem of, of police training. It is conceived as a problem of policing. Right? It is a, conceived as a problem of um, our misconception of what constitutes safety. Okay, so that is a radical notion, um, not because it is sort of like at the edge of accepted opinions, but instead because it goes for the root right, of the problem and is willing to overturn settled notions and start in a different place. The pragmatism, um, which I think is probably the more controversial claim is the uh, conviction in the movement in terms of um, actions, but also in terms of explicit discourses that what we need to do is to not only imagine, right, um, a radical otherwise world, but also plot the steps from here to there, right, practically, in a way that makes this sort of transformation irresistible um, to a great number of people, right, to a majority of the polity. Um, and that pragmatism um, in, it, uh, is embedded right in that pragmatism is this notion that um, we are not necessarily aiming for a, a utopia. Along the way of, of creating these steps, we may make mistakes. What is important is not perfection of ideology, but instead integrity of intention, commitment to accountability um, and responsibility toward um, both sort of the past of our ancestors who have um, carried on this work and the future, um, our children who we want to be involved in different fights, right? Um, so that is the sort of political philosophy that I think that the movement offers us. It offers us a chance to start in a different place um, to stop at least theoretically having the same arguments that we were having in the 20th century and instead base our politics on this notion, what does it look like if we decide that people matter? What does it look like if we decide that we want to live together? What does it look like if we take um, seriously the idea that anti-Blackness and anti-Black racism is um, it, you know, uh, uh, combined with uh, other kinds of sort of anti-colonial uh, um, and anti-Indigenous um, eugenicist viewpoints, um, patriarchy, capitalism, et cetera. But if we decide that these kind of foundational um, uh, problems of modernity um, are things that we can actually um, undo, unwind, unpack, not by reforming them, but actually from building a political philosophy from a different set of convictions and starting in a different place. Um, this is an extremely radical notion, and yet this movement has had a great deal of success um, in changing people's minds about the way things are, right? How we should interpret the way things are and expanded the horizon of possibility for the way things might be. Great. Thank you all for, um, 
for sharing your thoughts about how your work, um, uh, about your current work and, and your past work. And now you can see why, of course, I wanted you to be here to have this conversation because you are, you are the people to, to have this conversation with. So I just wanted to start off by um, asking posing a question, you know, Shatima brought this up in, in, in her remarks when she said that um, the, the Venn diagram of, of, of U.S. democracy and, and, and Black politics is it's the same circle, right? That Black people have been the sort of exemplary Democrats is one story. Another story, which is partly the story that I tell in my work, is that Black people have been expected to make these enormous sacrifices, right? on behalf of democracy, in some ways to be kind of the mules of US democracy. So part of what I wanted to start off by asking is, you know, in light of where we are in, um, oh God, it's April already, April of 2021, is how do you, how do you understand or, or the role that black politics has played in US democracy? What role is it playing today? What's your, um, What's your, uh, what's your metaphor for that relationship? No, I mean, I, I like the Venn diagram, you know, and, and I think the, the uh, you know, among the metaphors, you could have the Stacey Abrams as hero narrative, right, that also somehow um, reproduces the mules of democracy that you write in and the maintenance of democracy that um, was pretty vividly illustrated in the black people that had to clean up after the the white riot as you so aptly named it so i think that uh it is i mean is it a i mean the dichotomy is is very serious that it is both heroic and this uh mundane level maintenance that black people are are uh are expected to do right expected to continuously constantly be a democracy um, u.s democracy's exemplars and and as in your work you've shown right to constantly sacrifice to constantly do the maintenance work and then at times it's kind of recognized as heroic so i think those metaphors are apt i'll just jump in i love the the venn becomes a circle um and i'm so influenced on this question um, by your work, Professor Hooker, and thinking about Black politics and U.S. democracy and the extraordinary um, ask of Black people in the process of repair. Um, I will say, I think for me, I, I think obviously a lot about this question around racial violence um, and violence. And, and I think for a lot of us um, in our scholarship, in our, in, in our communities, it's, it's sometimes been seen that, I, at least for me, and let me just speak for myself, that I'm like screaming or talking into a black hole about the importance and the structuring role of violence in American politics. Um, and I mean, and for me, like over the last four years, and especially after this year, and especially after January 6th, it's now, I think, clear to many people that democratic politics cannot operate under the, under the threat of imminent violence, right? Like that has been, I feel like a refrain from black people since black people were brought here, right? That like, we cannot have you guys cannot profess to be a democracy and violently take away our right to vote our, and our participation in this country, right? And so for me, it seems kind of the way that I think about this is oftentimes black people have been kind of the people that have been, and I said, said this already, but holding up a mirror to this country, right? That it's like, here we have in terms of reconstruction, black people organizing, beginning of the 20th century, NAACP, Ida, well, Ida B. Wells at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th, um, her writing is like, oh, this is you? This is, right? NAACP, oh, th this, th that's you? Civil rights movement, right? Movement for black lives. And it's continuing like, is this who you actually profess to be? And if you're okay with this, if you're okay with this level of violence in a so-called democracy, um, th then proceed on. But it seems like in so many of these different moments, and there's more moments than this, of course, that like people are like, oh, oh like maybe we should do something, right? Um, and so to me, it's been like, so many of these movements are also a, are also part of holding this country accountable um, and for trying to push for more. And so that's how I kind of like, for me at least understand um, black politics and black people 
um, and US democracy. And then kind of this last question that's always been in the back of my mind, especially these past few years, is this question around legitimacy. And that part of it, part of kind of holding up the mirror has also been a question about legitimacy, right? That you, you actually do not have a legitimate democracy. That's what you pretend to be. But if you deny the right to vote to black people, right, then how can you call yourself a democracy, right? So, like that's, that was a claim in the 50s, 60s. It's also a claim in Georgia and in other places right now as well. You know, I think of, um, I too am very influenced by your work, um, Professor Hooker, um, in this question. Um, but, but you know what, I, I often think about, um, in addition to um, the injustice of the unequal sacrifice uh, that Black people are um, expected to bear uh, in American democracy, I also think about the ways that, um, you know, and and this metaphor of the Venn diagram, right, of Black politics um, and and American democracy being um, more or less the same circle. Um, I also think of the ways that um, Black political um, philosophy and action um, has always embodied uh, the sort of imagination toward implementation of democracy, right? So meaning that um, I think that it has, you know, Black politics in a way um, makes, um, makes the idea of American uh, democracy possible in a way that the sort of like deductive framing of the sort of founders does not and cannot, right? Um, so, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I should even looking like, but, but I mean, that's what I think. So, you know, sort of, you know, going back and kind of reading, you know, um, Du Bois and um, Cooper and, um, you know, and you can read outside of the American canon too, right? You can like um, think about Glitzant and um, the people in this conversation are um, taking the kind of um, the, the readings that they have as sort of foundational political concepts, right? Of which they are all um, very familiar and saying like, okay, so um, this is an idea. But actually, in order to implement it, in order to give it meaning, right, and, and in order to give it meaning at all, not just those sort of like full meaning completely, in order to give it meaning, these are the other things that have to be taken into account, right? Um, and and that's not just um, about um, you know um, uh, the inclusion of black, the, the 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 cessation of. Um, um, genocidal and lethal violence, right, uh, against, um, you know, indigenous and black people um, in this country, but it's also always included, uh, of course, um, uh, you know, uh, critiques of patriarchy and the nuclear family, and it has also always included critiques of the way that labor is structured um, and the way that um, ex exploitation allows labor to be structured in the American context. So, um, so yeah, so I think that the impact is even more profound profound than just a, a question of being made to sacrifice or holding up, up a mirror, although we do those things. But I also think that when you look at Black political thought, you actually see um, the conditions of the possibility of, of, of freedom, right, uh, and justice and democracy. Thank you all very much. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I think is really paradoxical is, is is as Diva and as and Megan and Shadima also pointed out, right? That despite this kind of exemplary labor, there's also a willingness to continually um, not uh, not support and 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 um, you know and actually actively prevent the carrying out of that democratic labor by Black people in some ways, right? So that so that that, that is the, the sort of foundational tension. And of course, the, the movement right now, and um, that is, you know, sort of the, the latest iteration, if you will, of the sort of Black freedom struggle, the movement for Black lives, um, is I think kind of um, interestingly um, exemplary of that tension, um, because on the one hand, right, there's an embrace of some of, of the claims around um, you know, against police violence and, and a sort of recognition of, of um, structural racism. But there was also a lot of critique and a lot of, you know, um, pushback on things like defund the police and other, um, other ideas in the movement. So I wanted to ask you all to, to say a little bit about um, the, um, 
about Black Lives Matter and how do you assess the accomplishments of the movement, the challenges it faces. Um, and, and, and we've actually already um, had a question too um, that perhaps Megan will, will want to address about how to think about um, the, the somewhat decentralized model that, that, um, that seems to struggle against the constraints of the nonprofit industrial complex and how we think about that. So um, I'm throwing that huge uh, question out to you all. All right, so I'll just come in. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to address the first part, which I think is the most, well, it could be kind of debatable about what's the most important part here. But I do think it's really, I mean, to talk about challenges and also to talk about accomplishments. But let me spend a, a, a little bit of time on, on this part about accomplishments, I mean, about challenges in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, it strikes me that uh, one of the challenges, especially moving forward from this movement, um, that was underfunded. And if I'm perfectly honest, I think still underfunded. I think that there were a number of articles that came out in mainstream, um, uh, 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 what is it, articles, newspapers, New York Times, I'm looking at you, right? I was like, oh my gosh, the black, black, black protesters are overwhelmed with funds. Uh, okay. But it's also true that corporations, individual donors and foundations always should have been supporting black movement building forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Right. So, yes, a lot of money came through here, but it does present a number of, I think, concerning questions about where does the where does the movement go from here? Um, there is, as somebody in the Q&A mentioned, there is concerns and I think real issues that the movement needs to struggle through with in terms of um, kind of national leadership and local leadership. We see this playing out right now in terms of social media, right, with the movement for Black Lives, some individual chapters and Black Lives Matter Global. Um, and it is clear here that there have some, been some tensions that have arisen over funding, some over leadership, some about coordination, about issues that are actually important, right? Um, and this is something, but it's not like that unique to the movement for Black Lives in the sense if you understand the full trajectory, right, of social movements, it, like it, as, as a whole, as a whole thing, and or even if kind of more discreetly, if you focus on the Black freedom movement, there have been many different moments um, in social movements in the Black freedom movement where tensions arise oftentimes at moments when movements become pretty successful, right? Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't denigrate the focus of the movement. It just is a point in terms of this tension where people figure things out um, and then people grow. They, they, lessons become learned and then they grow. So I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen, right, in terms of the national and local chapters, um, but that is an issue that does likely need to get worked out. Now, I do think though, it, it, it relates to the larger issue for me, which is one around funding. And the worry, and I think this is a correct worry for some people um, and some chapters and, and organizers um, is worry about the role of funding and co-opting the agenda um, of the movement um, and shifting the strategies of the movement, right? There is a sense, and this is one of the things I loved about uh, the Movement for Black Lives policy, early pol policy platform, um, was there was already a recognition about the way that funders had co-opted um, the kind of the main, mainstream civil rights movement of the, of, um, of the 50s and 60s. Um, and so there was, a, there was already kind of acknowledgement of how sometimes funders work, even with the best of intentions. Um, as a result of the nonprofit industrial complex, though, and the reason why I think this other question about local chapters and the national chapter relates to um, uh, kind of this other worry about funders is to me the question right now, one of the biggest challenges is a question about accountability. For the leaders and for the like the non-leaders also of the movement, who are people accountable to? For the national chapter, who are they accountable to? For chapters that are receiving a lot of funds right now, who are you accountable to? We have a system right now, and I think the worry for some people is that movements um, or chapters and or organizations become more accountable to donors than they actually do to black people and or to citizens and people that they actually are representing, right? And so how do we make sure um, that the focus stays on, stays on the people and isn't on uh, hashtag activism 
and t-shirts and sweatshirts, right? And isn't just all performance and performative, right? How do we actually make sure um, that the focus is on, let's say things relating directly to the policy platform? And what happens when really smart people and well-intentioned people have different ideas of what that agenda should actually look like. So I think that there's a big issue here in terms of a challenge around accountability. And as the movement is more funded than it's ever been before, what is going to be the role of donors um, in this movement? So I'll end there. Yeah, so, um, you know, I agree with, uh, you know, a lot of what Megan said, but first I just wanna make clear the accomplishments of the movement, which have been uh, um, actually pretty colossal um, in uh, the eight years since um, the uh, hashtag was born um, and the seven years since the movement for Black Lives um, uh, sort of coalesced into a um, kind of hub network um, that um, uh, spans, but does not totally encompass the sort of broad and networked movement. Um, okay, so uh, just, just a few sort of things. So the movement in its time span has changed the common ways we talk about race, inequality, policing, and well-being, and inserted a common understanding, a common sense understanding of structural racism and anti-Blackness into mainstream American discourse. Um, the way that we talk in politics um, today um, and the uh, sort of political policies that are possible as a result um, are radically different than they were just five years ago. Um, uh, this incorporation of new concepts into the political lexicon has opened up possibilities for redress that did not exist prior to the movement and could not exist without the movement. Um, there's also been sort of vast transformations in um, public opinion, um, uh, particularly um, what, and it's caused actually a bifurcation um, of opinion uh, uh, for white Americans um, where um, if, if if white Americans were studied the way that black Americans are studied, um, we would be obsessed with this um, uh, deep polarization that seems to have emerged within their community. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, so, you know, so, so that is something that has happened. Um, there's also been a wide diffusion of new political tactics and a um, kind of um, a repoliticization of public life in terms of um, what people understand to be possible uh, through their own action. And so the main tactics that have been diffused um, and the most effective also are the, um, uh, the, the realization, right, the awareness um, that um, people now have that we elect district attorneys, for example, um, and that they can be gotten rid of uh, and that others can be sort of put in their place and that that can directly and dramatically and immediately impact the lived experiences of people in those communities and jurisdictions. This is a very widespread tactic now um, that is undertaken not only by movement organizations, but by folks in general, uh, because it has increased. Again, this is goes back to this notion of a democratic labor, right? This is a thing that we do to save the lives of black people, but it is also just a thing that is good for democracy, right? <laughs> like it's just good, right? Um, so this tactic has been taken up widely, right? As a sort of like um, reminder um, and democratic, you know, as a result of the democratic education that the movement has done. Um, but there are other kinds of um, sort of political tactics like this. So for example, um, the, uh, the use of bail funds, right? And the enormous population, uh, popularity of bail funds to um, get people um, uh, out of jail, right? Now, this was a tactic that had already existed, but that the movement popularized, particularly for domestic policing issues. It had been mostly used for um, immigration court um, issues um, uh, and on a much smaller scale. Um, but also in addition to sort of making people aware again of the democratic possibility, right, um, that is, um, you know, there when people sort of combine their resources together. Um, they've also made possible the notion that the cash bail system is fundamentally unjust and we should do away with it. And that has resulted in the passage of several laws, right, <laughs> um, um, in states ending cash bail systems. Okay, um, and in addition to that, we've had, of course, an overturning of, and again, something that's good for democracy in general, um, we've seen that um, people who were politicized in movement have um, run for and taken elected office on a variety of local levels, right? Um, and this is sometimes folks who are um, politicized in movement and are part of movement, folks that are in proximity, just in proximity to movement and um, are sort of reawakened to politics um, and go into 
um, and understand themselves as democratic agents. Uh, this has also happened on the national level, uh, although on a more sort of limited um, uh, uh, scale, but one that I, I expect to grow, right? Cori Bush, I think, is one of, of several that are coming up, um, you know, who are disrupting um, actually democratic dynasties, right? Um, and putting folks who are uh, aligned with movement objectives as outlined in the 2016 and 2020 platform, uh, A Vision for Black Lives, um, you know, into places where they can share in sort of official de decision-making power. In addition to that, there are other parts of the movement and this speaks to the kind of the network struggle. So, um, you know, all of the kind of tensions that um, Megan talked about are absolutely extant and real, right? Um, there are also, as she said, not unique to this movement. All social movements have these tensions. Um, you know, some social movements are ripped apart and destroyed by these tensions, right? Um, this social movement, part of its advantage in weathering, and I do believe it will weather these tensions, is that it is networked, right? Is that even if we have a big problem with BLM Global Network's use of their funds or transparency about their funds, they are not the only organization in movement, right? By a long shot. Right, there are dozens, hundreds of organizations um, that are involved in movement who all specialize in their own things, have their own skills, have their own agendas, who are then able to band together and coordinate efforts um, because this movement has been developed in this uh, particular era where networking is second nature to all of us and we have the technology um, to make that possible. And the folks who became organizers in this era learned to become organizers with the utilization of this networking technology, um, which also influenced their preferences for how the overall movement is structured. Um, so this networked decentralized aspect is a feature, not a bug, okay, um, of, the, of the movement for Black Lives. And it will allow it, I think, um, to sort of weather the very normal, right, natural storms of um, political conflict and tension, not only from within the movement, from outside the movement as well, right, um, you know, uh, going forward. Um, it's also the case that this movement is really self-consciously um, uh, dedicated to or, or to learning from learning from the movements of the past, right? And particularly from the mid 20th century black civil rights movement. Um, there are a lot of people who are involved as elders, right? Um, who um, really just tell their stories, right? Um, and and um, have advice and, um, you know, um, have been in, in spaces of struggle before and um, people take that really seriously um, in this particular movement. So I just wanted to sort of make clear, I think people often misrecognize the sort of scale of the accomplishments of this movement and reduce it to the still very laudable um, size of the mobilizations that the movement is able to put together, which is, is awesome. I mean, obviously having the largest protest um, in, uh, as far as we know, American history this past summer is an enormous accomplishment, but that's just absolutely the beginning of the accomplishment. The organizing that was born out of that moment Right, um, the uh, sort of um, uh, the the politicization of, of such a vast array of people to uh, a way of thinking about politics that is not only black led in terms of structurally right in movement organizations and aligned organizations, but also in terms of political philosophy. Right, and that was a moment when the movement got to organize people. Um, into their organizations, but also just in the American polity in general, um, and teach them how to speak the language as a matter of course, right? And how to expect their representatives to speak the language as a matter of course of systemic and structural racism, right? And to have that incorporated into um, our analysis, right, of the kinds of things that ought to be politically possible and politically expected, right, going forward. Um, this is what makes something like the slogan defund the police anything, uh, you know, politically possible. And it always actually um, cracks me up when people are like, people are, you know, like, that's a really unpopular phrase. And I'm like, 40% of people agree with that phrase. That's an enormous, I mean, I just, like, as a student, of, I mean, as a student of public opinion, like, that's just um, for social movement demand to poll at 40% acceptance out of the gate is very, um, very unusual. But beyond that, um, the underlying components of defund, right, are, are popular at, at levels that exceed 
um, uh, you know, by a large margin majorities, right? So we're into sort of like two thirds of people uh, agree, right? That, um, you know, um, police should not be the first people deployed to um, situations that uh, are, are not violent, right? That mental health workers should be um, more utilized, that, um, you know, um, that police forces could stand to be um, um, repurposed or shrunk. Um, all of these ideas are actually really re resonant. And we see in um, dozens of the localities and several states, uh, people already undertaking these reforms, popular or unpopular. And the movement, right, organizations continue to push not only these claims discursively, but also to write policy, right? Um, <laughs> right uh, um, which, for example, the Breathe Act, is all about, right, how is it that we um, become a more decarceral, um, you know, society and nation. And now the BREATHE Act um, has been authored by policy folks in the movement. Um, it has not been officially introduced onto the floor of con uh, Congress, but every sort of segment of that policy, uh, that, that sort of uh, bill, then serves as a model for people who are writing policies that do get introduced. Right um, in state houses and then also in the Congress, right in bits and pieces and in parts. So um, you know, I, the level of kind of uh, uh, sophistication um, and um, the opportunity, right, that we have at this moment um, for this movement, I think is is really quite unprecedented. Um, and so I agree that this question of accountability. Um, is going to be central in this ability to actually implement the ethics um, that uh, are, you know, sort of outlined in movement discourses is going to be critical uh, going forward. But if, right, um, these questions are able to be resolved, um, they're resolved enough for people to continue to work together and push um, from all their different positionalities and in all the different directions um, that they seek, then I think that we have something that is potentially transformative on our hands um, and transformative in a way that might allow us, um, you know, uh, our descendants, right, at the beginning of the 22nd century uh, to read um, Du Bois's words <laughs> at the opening of the Souls of Black Folks and say, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad that's not the way it is anymore, right? I'm glad this is not the central political question. Um, <laughs> I know Shatima, you don't believe me, but that is the possibility I believe is opening. I think that this is a kind of, um, you know, not necessarily, not through the sort of like policies of the US Congress, but through the transformation of people's ideas about what justice is and includes and the things that we have to do in order to address it. It is absolutely not the case that I don't believe you. And I think that um, I'm gonna say to, Juliet that I have nothing to add to that. And I think that it is appropriate because everything I know about the movement su success, I get got from reading uh, Diva's book and from uh, stalking her Twitter feed. So this whole thing is just revealing me as a creepy stalker of uh, Diva. So I'll let it go with that. So actually, um, Shatima, I want to, I have a question that perhaps um, you can answer and I'm, I'm going to start um, taking some of the questions from the Q&A so we get time to get to them. So somebody raised a uh, question related to the, um, the trial that's going on right now of, of, the, of Chauvin and, and um, George, you know, in the death of George Floyd and the killing of George Floyd and asking about whether kind of, you know, um, charges to be pursued for the other officers. And, and you mentioned that you've been engaging with, um, you know, um, abolitionists, um, feminism. And so I'm wondering if you could say something about, you know, and, and Diva mentioned this in her answer as well, this sort of question of, of um, you know, the way in which it's, it's, the movement is really trying to rethink really in a really um, radical way, um, you know, the way in which we think about, you know, how we approach certain kinds of of social problems, how we think about um, incarceration, so-called criminal justice, it's never justice, right? Um, but I wonder if, I guess one question maybe that we can think it would be helpful to get your perspective on is thinking about, um, you know, there's a long standing strand of, of, of course, work on abolition, prison abolition um, that 
has kind of come together in some ways with the movement for Black Lives. So how do you see that relationship? And, and what, what do you see, what do you think those kind of, you know, particularly feminist perspectives um, are offering us to, to, in this moment to thinking about questions of, of state violence and, um, and the kinds of questions you're thinking about in your project? Uh, yeah, no, thank you. So uh, what I see in, in prison uh, abolitionist thinking and the fact that uh, Black and queer feminists have been on the forefront of contemporary iterations and, and thinking about it. And that's, that was the thing I was gonna say before Diva spoke that, uh, you know, I can't believe that uh, prison abolition has been uh, elevated to a kind of political mainstream. It's, it's really quite fascinating. So I understand, and I think that, I understand uh, abolition feminists to be saying that what uh, prison abolition is, is represents um, thinking about care, right? And, and how we can um, go about exercising care in public. Uh, and I don't know what it means for Chauvin, you know, I'm not gonna think about that, but, or, you know, or it's, it's to be thought about. But what I have been thinking about is the fact that um, in reading about the sexual assault to prison pipeline, I think that nothing demonstrates the dismantling of the welfare state um, or, you know, America's pitiful, the U.S.'s pitiful version of it sort of in response to Black uh, equality claims as, you know, and this is in the work of Elizabeth Hinton, in the work of um, Gilmore, um, Heather and Thompson, um, and of course, all indebted to Angela Davis, but the, the sexual assault to prison pipeline is the best demonstration I've ever seen of a society that's fully breaking down around principles of care in public, right? So that all of the things that lead uh, girls into juvenile detention, so truancy, um, uh, acting out of school, right? All of these forms of disruptive behavior are literally what people understand as a uh, girl's trauma response to sexual assault. And we are funneling girls into prison as the response to this trauma, right? And so what, um, what I see um, as having happened with um, prison abolition working its way into the mainstream, I, I mean, I remember being a, an undergraduate and, and going to see Angela Davis speak and being like, what is she talking about, right? And so to live in this moment now is just, I mean, it's, phenomenal um, and it's not that yeah I mean it's, it's quite amazing but it, it becomes a kind of it is obviously the response to this breakdown that violence is the only thing that we will distribute that violence becomes our solution to every social problem right and no the abolitionist response is no we have a duty of care and we must care for people and they're finally, they finally have the floor after, right, um, you know, however long Gilmore and Hinton chart this path from taking that world away from us, right, in the U.S., is what I would say. Thank you, and, and my apologies for putting you on the spot by directing that uh, question at you. Um, so, so we have a, and I want to encourage people, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I'll try to, to intersperse them. But we have a question in the Q&A that um, actually might be a, a good segue into a question that, um, that I was going to ask, which is, you know, there's a question about how do you see or how do you think about Black people who subscribe to uh, conservative narratives and the notion of leaving the plantation or thinking about, I guess, trying to think about what Black politics should be in the current moment. Um, and so, and moving forward. Um, and, you know, certainly I think there is, you know, one of the interesting things about this moment is that so much of the kind of, as, as you all have said, the kind of democratic, the energy is coming from these moments like 
you know, abolition of feminism, it's coming from um, the movement for black lives, all of these, you know, um, and as well as the organizing around voting of, of, um, of um, black groups and, and, and black women. And at the same time, right, there's also these kind of countervailing forces that are also, right, say, you know, trying to, of course, enact now these voter suppression bills and also trying to, to, to kind of depress that activism. So I'm wondering, what do you think about this question of, of how do we think about this moment in terms of internally, right, in terms of, 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 of Black, this, this is a moment of, of Black politics and, and, and are people more engaged, less engaged? How do we think about, about the, the way in which people are, are relating to this? I'm gonna try to start. This this is a very big question. I'm looking at my co-panelists here, um, and and it's such a good question, right? Um, so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to think out loud for just a little bit here, and then I'm gonna need one of my other panelists to come in and take this baton for me. Um, so. I, I've been thinking in the back of my mind a lot about kind of like what does this moment pretend for the future of black politics right um and i think that there's so many stories like there isn't just one story um and i think that is always really exciting and at least in terms of the literature we always know in terms of black politics michael dawson of course tells us that there isn't just like one black politics there's not a monolith black politics right there's all these different types of black politics um for me though it's clear that one of the exciting aspects about this moment and i do is exactly correct that in terms of after after she was speaking about all the accomplishments of the movement for black lives and it, my screen kept on saying like you are you are you are muted if you want because i'm over here like yes that's right absolutely that we are living through this incredible moment in the united states in black politics where so many things that previously were unimaginable have become center stage right like where the impossible is suddenly maybe possible or 40 percent used to be like seven percent right that so to me i think that i'm thinking a lot about i know there's been a number of people reverend barber um dory moore and sabio roman have speak have been talking about this as a possible third reconstruction moment that here we have some of the most radical dreaming of what could be possible for our future. We have people in terms of uh, like voices that we previously hadn't heard before. Um, and so uh, to me, I think that the possibility um, of something very different than what is now is to me like very exciting and is to me what I'm thinking about a lot. The, and the idea here, it feels like that so much of my life has been got, has been kind of like a focus on thinking about what are band-aids, what are small changes that we can make a, a, around the margins to make life better for Black people, right? And it really kind of a belief that pretty much ended with the Obama presidency, that if Black people did all these different things, then Black people could be full citizens in the way that white people are full citizens, right? And so now it's like, that didn't happen. That's not going to happen. And so what we need is something completely radically different here. And, and it just feels that there's so much more energy and acceptance of that idea, um, that we did everything. We all, we did all the reform and y'all are still violent. Y'all still don't think that we citizens. Y'all still trying to take away our rights. You guys elected white supremacists as president. Like it ain't working. So you know what? We're, we're done, we're done, with, we're done with your way and your rule book. And what we're going to do is try a new rule book and do it our way. And that's like exciting. So that's where I'm at right now. Somebody else take it from me. Um, I agree with Megan, um, but I, you know, and you know, I'm so, yeah, I, I agree with Megan in so many ways. At the same time, I want to stress that this possibility is not a guarantee, right? And, and I, that I actually don't subscribe to the uh, kind of the, the, the arc of the moral universe kind of, um, uh, argument at all right like so so um you know anything can happen <laughs> right like um full-on collapse of american democracy and um fascism right can absolutely happen that is a possibility in this moment because some people um have uh responded to these sort of rubbing up against right the sort of lie of um you know um uh the end of history right the uh, developmental liberalism um, by being like, oh, right, okay, bet that I'm going to be a white supremacist fascist, right? Because it's then it's okay for me, you know, then I can get mine and domination is okay and we can have these kinds of ideas, right? These kinds of ideas have circulated, right, um, uh, in, in, in political philosophy and human philosophy for, for, 
for forever. And some people are taking them up. Um, and those people are usually don't have any kinds of internal conflicts about violence either, right? Like that's the other thing that we, right? Um, that people uh, who, could, who are sort of on the left, people who are also in black political traditions is that, um, you know, um, we have we have to have a conversation, right, about violence, right? It's not that people have the same views, but like there's a variety of opinion, okay? Um, and so then we have to work that out before we sort of are doing anything. Um, so, so all that to say is that everything's on the table, but I mean, that's what makes the possibility exciting, right? Because at most other periods, you know, Megan's right. What we had to consider was like, here's a Band-Aid here and here's a little rejigger here. We could just turn the way we're facing in this light, you know what I mean? And like maybe, you know, like, um, and look, and, and, that, and, and, and that was appropriate for that moment. In this moment, um, this radical dreaming is uh, appropriate. And um, that's both for, I think, external, right, exogenous um, and endogenous reasons, right? This movement is, is, many, is creating uh, possibilities, right, opportunities at the same time that the world is also kind of, and its instability is creating these openings. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to sort of put that out there, right? Like the, the you know, one six, the January 6th insur insurrection is also indicative, right? Um, of, a, of a kind of world. This is privately for me, why I think that perhaps like speculative um, everything, right? Speculative fiction, speculative movies like um, have become sort of dominant in our culture um, in, in this moment, much more so than they were 20 or 30 years ago, because I feel like there's this kind of acknowledgement that we are in a moment in which many different timelines can emerge, right? And so then the question becomes um, for us, right? For all of us, um, uh, for, for people who are, are doing black politics, people who are interested in democracy, the question becomes, okay, so how is it that we can shape change in order to um, make the timeline emerge in which people can thrive, um, in which um, you know black people and all people can live uh, freely, um, and and that's really the crux of the issue for me, right right now. I mean, that's that's the thing I think we have to be asking ourselves all the time. I mean, I just wrote down uh, the black universal, and that's all I got. Um, you know, like that, and I'll have to talk to Adam about this, but you know, just living through, and all of us, I think, are speaking about living through the time when somehow we weren't a part of history to everyone coming to recognize that maybe we really are the, the drive, right? The drivers. And I, I sent uh, Megan uh, a tweet and I think it was uh, a scholar responding to uh, Nikhil Singh talking about, um, you know, like violence against the black body as a, as a sort of universal sort of um, organizing thing that could sort of stand as a universal. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe this is a, a silly point, but uh, the the point about the timelines that can emerge, I mean, we, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the, the what was it? The, the um, US election as the, the Avengers thing that came out where, you know, Stacey Abrams comes to save Joe Biden as Captain America, right? I mean, so this, you right. So we are in these timelines and then, and, yeah, and we wouldn't be black if it wasn't right tragic comic if if we didn't know that it could all go wrong as much hope as we have and to to live with the um to you know to cite James Cone right the tragedy and hope if it wasn't if if both weren't ever present right if the the cross right and and the connections between the cross and lynching and all these things that have guided us for a really long time that if we weren't really hopeful about what we've done and then also knew, um, you know, like as in, as is in Gorman's poem, right? Like that people are outside the door to break everything that we fix all the time. And, and, and I think again, you know, democracy is a practice, right? We're never gonna fix it. We always gotta keep practicing it. So, yeah. Can I just say, I feel like, okay. I might get a try. I feel like this insight that you have just said, right? Um, that democracy is um, a practice and it ain't never gonna be fixed. A lot of people say that democracy is a practice, but I feel like it's really black feminism that says it ain't never gonna get fixed, right? Like 
we are going to have to keep doing it and to be okay with that, right? I think that that sends some folks into a, a pessimistic direction. And I think that, um, you know, it sends, uh, you know, uh, other folks into thinking, oh, no, we just haven't designed the exact right institutions yet. Right. You know, I think that black feminism and this is where the pragmatism, I think, in black feminism is so profound is that it's like, look, y'all, we are going to do the best we can and we're going to keep doing the best we can. And hopefully the best you can future generations will be better than the best we could. Right. And that's all I got for you <laughs> in the meantime. Right. Like, enjoy yourself and take care of each other. I just feel like I mean, I feel like, you know. That's an important thing for an um, important perspective, I think, to become more uh, sort of prevalent um, in order for people to be enabled to do the work they need to do um, in the face of this fact, right, that you have presented us with, Shatima, that whatever you fix, there will be people at the door, right? So, so what do you do about that? How do you understand that that is the condition right, of human societies, and particularly one shaped by white supremacy, um, patriarchy, and capitalism. Well, I'm not sure how to follow up that, um, <laughs> what just happened here. <laughs> it feels like maybe the panel should be over now, but I'm going to give it, give it a try, a shot at one last question. Um, and, and I think it really has to do about, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the, um, the role that black politics um, plays in US democracy and thinking about um, you know, that relationship and, 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 and also, but I think there's also something that, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, um, about grief and loss in my, in my own work. And we've certainly seen, for example, in the, in the, um, the Chauvin trial, for example, that a lot of this, the way in which the sort of, you know, um, you know, um, that these, these narratives, right, or this, this public performance of grief is so, um, becomes so central to the way in which we expect Black citizens to, to be citizens. Um, and I think, Diva, that you're, you're pointing this and, and Shakima too, in thinking about Black feminism and thinking, like, right, that, yes, racial violence and, and grief has been important and, and, and central to mobilization, but there's also been other things. There's also been black life, there's also been care, there's also been, you know, um, and so I'm wondering how do we, how do we think, um, how do we, you know, think about those things without, you know, um, overemphasizing, right, one of them. And I don't know if, if you all have thoughts to offer on, on that question. I mean, on a light note, I don't, I don't like the one thing I think black people don't need is academics to tell them how to enjoy life. <laughs> and I think they're doing okay and, and, um, and continue to, to, um, to produce phenomenal things that, um, yeah, right, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, can't even describe. But I think what what is important and I think incumbent on us and on me um, is for us to recognize it and try to figure out how to put those effective register, right? Because I know perhaps when I look at history, all I see is the death, right? All I see is the violence and all I see is, is the suffering. And that is certainly not um, what people have been up to, right? And, and that, um, yeah, I mean, so I think for me personally, uh, my response in thinking about that is to really try to figure where where that where that fits in in my thinking to to know that the people people are producing it right. I mean, a meme a day or whatever, right? It's, it exists, it circulates widely, it you know it becomes a part of our economy, and it is certainly there and will be there and has has. Um, despite tremendous violence, and I hate the word resilience, it's, it's there and it, 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 it's um, sublime, you know? So yeah, that, that's what I'll say. Diva, you know you talk about Black Joy. I'll talk on and on about it, and I don't want to take up too much space. So um, I was waiting for Megan to, to jump in. Uh, 
but um, <laughs> was. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, what can I do? I agree with you, Shatima, uh, um, that, uh, you know, um, um, that, that it is true that Black people do not need academics to tell them how to enjoy life, but uh, academics do need to pay attention to Black people uh, in terms of what um, work joy does and particularly in political science. Um, you know, and that's the thing that I am um, so, I'm so, so interested in actually, is that like, you know, all this resilience is not some kind of innate, you know, it's not, you know, there's a way in which we can also reify this resilience. It was like, you, you, know, like, you know, black people, you know what I mean? And it's just like, yes, I mean, yes. And right, um, this has, it's doing work. Right. So this is me and my kind of like, you know, Foucauldian turn or something like this. It's like it's not an accident. Right. Like this joy, this per, this very well developed um, kind of, um, um, you know, cultural traditions creating and making joy and jokes and um, laughter and dancing in art in any given situation. Right. Is is not just something that's like genetically inherent. It is a political strategy and it always has been. And it's been well developed over generations, right? Like, I mean, this is a survival strategy, um, you know, that is, you know, inculcated, right? Passed down through culture um, that people reproduce, right? Because the conditions of black lives remain so, um, you know, um, a, a contingent and subject to domination and oppression. And yet also available for all of the ingenious ways um, that um, we live and produce livingness, right? Um, um, not only for ourselves, but also for others, right? Like, I mean, I think one of the things about, um, okay, there's so much to say. This is why I mean, you shouldn't have gotten me started on this. So, so one of the things about the sort of like social media in this moment also, and this is what I started to notice at the beginning of the movement is that, you know, it, it social media is really, really good for transmitting a affective um, states, right? And one of the dominant affective states in the movement from the beginning was joy, um, love, care, right? Like at the very beginning when those um, videos, um, um, you know, first started cir circulating of Black people being murdered or stalked or harassed um, by agents of the state or white, white people who decided they were vigilantes, you also had the sort of counter circulation of these videos that were love notes. They were literal videos of just love. Like, Black people, I just want you to know that I love you um, and that if you don't feel comfortable watching this, you don't have to, right? Like this was a, this was deployed at exactly the same time, right? Um, and that's not accidental, right? Um, and it's not because of sentiment per se. This is an expression of a political strategy, I think that has really deep roots um, and that we as academics, right? As political scientists don't pay enough attention to. And I have to say, this is probably gonna get me in trouble. This is why Afro-pessimism pisses me off so much. Um, uh, <laughs> it gets on my nerves because because um, it is absolutely not the case and never was the case, right? That black people have ever um, not been living, right? Not been producing life, um, not been producing new forms of life, new languages to describe life and living, right? So I fundamentally reject uh, the characteristic uh, characterization of black life as um, you know, um, defined or conditioned by death. I mean, that's, that's just, that's, I don't even. You heard you know. it here. <laughs> I'm like, you're like, uh. <laughs> I just really want to amplify like everything that has been said by Shatima and by Diva. Um, also just really, especially because I'm amongst political scientists right now, really this also in terms of, it's also important for academia and for political scientists to see black people and to see joy, right? That it's not just in terms of the ways that institutions are like act upon black people and harm black people, um, but it's also about in terms of how black people make meaning um, and find joy and live their lives in these different moments and through it all. I think for me, kind of most of my research focuses on these like terrible moments, right? In, in, a, in a campaign around racial violence. But for me, the thing that like kept me moving and researching and the thing that I found so much excitement in was like not in obviously the lynching and the mob violence and the retelling of that, but actually 
how Black people through those moments and around those moments created joy and created meaning in their lives. And the kind of my, one of my favorite stories that I tell is around um, the the lynch the anti lynching bill um, when it went for full deliberation in the House of Representatives in 1922, black people packed out the rafters. They showed up, <laughs> they showed up, and they were hooping and hollering, and they were booing uh, uh, representatives when they were making statements like against the anti lynching bill, and they were cheering, and it was like wild applause uh, when representatives in the House were making uh, statements in support of the anti lynching bill um, because it's like after this kind of debating this in terms of this, in some ways, a, kind of a terrible piece of, anti, of, of uh, well, a piece of legislation about a terrible act that happens, that there is still in terms of such joy in being together. Um, and that to me, in terms of when we think about the present, just to kind of draw an arc here, when we think about the present, the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for Black lives, it has always been the case in terms of that one of the things that comes out of Black politics is the importance of community, um, of group mobilization and doing things together. That has always been a part of it. Um, that like, I don't even, you know, I, I'm not a theorist, so I can say that I don't, black African pessimism and the focus on debt, I'm like, what? Like, at least in terms of my research on black politics, there's so much life. Um, and I think that's what we're really seeing right now. So that's really exciting. And on that, okay. So thank you all so much. I had very high expectations and you all somehow managed to exceed them, which is which is already saying a lot. Thank you for sharing your time and, and, and your brilliance. Um, I wanna also thank Tony Bogues, the director of the um, Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, who's the one who prodded me to put this panel together. And I was like, oh, let me go find my favorite people to talk about black politics with. Um, and I just want to say that I think it's it's lovely that we end on this note of, of, of Black world building and what that world building puts out into the world for everyone. So thank you all for your time and your brilliance. Thank you all for sharing your time with us too to the SNDs.